Ecclesiastes chapter 7 will be the first place that we look. Pretty reminded me this morning to let everyone know that we are opening our house up on Saturday as a pre Thanksgiving get together. So if anyone would like to add more information, she's the person to talk to. I don't do plannings or dates or events. I don't, I don't keep any of that stuff track st straight in my mind, at least. So she's the person to talk to. I was told a long time ago that a quiet con a congregation is a dying con a congregation. As a general rule of thumb, it's always nice to hear uh, all the little chitter chatter and all the little rustlings that go along with having children who get to, to grow up in an environment uh, that gets to learn about God. And I'm also reminded over in Acts chapter 20 that the, the most notable service that we have recorded for us is one where it had the biggest distraction. Someone ended up falling out a window, but distractions are not always a bad thing. They are noteworthy, and sometimes they are great to have. I find myself wanting to quantify and qualify as much as I can in life. I like to, to get things kind of parceled out. I like them to be consumable. And so usually I kind of section things off into categories. And when it comes to our actions, we can really separate our actions into two main categories. We have actions and we have reactions. We have the things that as you wake up in the morning, you say, here's the things that I plan on doing throughout the day. Those are the actions that I plan on. And then there's the reactions. It's all the little things in life that happen that you don't ever expect to happen, and you have to figure out how you're going to react to those things. Actions are easier to plan out than reactions, because I can guess what I want to do today, but I can't always guess what I'm going to have to do in the day. And that's why, when it comes to matters of maturity, both mental and spiritual maturity, our reactions really become the gold standard. Because I can have good intentions, and I can have good actions that I want to do throughout the day, but how I react to situations really determine how mature I am, both mentally and spiritually. Reacting, when reacting to people, it's almost always easier to love those who love you. And it can be really pleasurable to be nice to those who are already nice to you. And even sometimes it's, hard, or it's easier to be nice to a complete stranger than it is to be nice to someone who you're currently having a struggle with that you do know. But as Christians, we are told not to just plan to be nice to those who are nice to us, or plan to be kind to those who are already kind, but we are told to strive hard to have a good reaction to those who are unkind, to pray for those who persecute us, to go the extra mile whenever we're not expecting to go one mile in the first place. And so our reactions are a huge part of Christianity. As we look here in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 9, what I, what I would like to do this morning is look at a few different emotion, emotional reactions that we normally have, and look at what is the, the core reason behind them and figure out why God has asked us to control our reactions in those areas. Here in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, there in verse 9, Solomon says, Do not be quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the hearts of fools. A passage we probably know fairly well is in James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I think it was one of my mom. My mom had about... 12 verses that I got quoted at all the time as a kid, um, usually very fitting for me as a child and the things that I was currently <coughs> dealing with growing up. And James chapter 1 is no exception. There in verse 19 to verse 20, James says there in verse 19, Know this, my, love, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Or as my grandpa always said, he said, you've been given two ears and one mouth, so you should always listen twice as much as you talk. Two great pieces of advice. But here, James is reminding us that our anger, that natural reaction to the things that go in our lives, does not produce the righteousness that God requires. And jumping back over the Old Testament for just a second, in Psalm 4, I guess if I would have thought about flipping back and forth, I would have arranged these passages in a more suitable fashion for page flipping. But in Psalm 4, there in verse 4, when David writes this psalm, he writes, Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your hearts on your bed and be silent. 
Anger is not always forbidden as a reaction to the things that we go through, like some of the other things we'll be talking about this morning. Jesus, Jesus was often angry. God is often angry. And we can really, as we talked about, we can separate our actions into actions and reactions. We can separate anger into two separate categories. The two major groups that I'm going to just give names to this morning, one is a righteous indignation and one is a worldly anger. Righteous indignation is really um, is what we see Jesus describe. When God displays this, when people, um, when they're angry about God, people breaking God's laws, about being hypocritical, about abusing God's people or God's temple, as we'll talk about in a moment, misleading and misteaching people, teaching his doctrines, the commandments, and then these are all times where Jesus gets angry that things are happening around him. They are anger comes from uh, this anger is really about the anger that causes that we get whenever we see people who are hurting themselves, or hurting others around them for the, their unrighteous actions, and we're angry about the effects that it has on their lives. This is when God, this is what we see when God gets angry. Individuals who God has given good and righteous commandments who are going to help them in their life, and then they don't do them. This is the kind of anger that motivates us to show people the error of their ways. It's the anger that drives us to solve problems and to rectify mistakes. On the other hand, worldly anger derives from personal indignation, meaning that I've been hurt and I'm angry at you. That I have been misled or I've been abused or I've been wronged, or I perceive that I have been wronged or inconvenienced in some way. And those are the types of anger that is really cracked down on in the scriptures. That's what we have to be particularly careful for. It is Jesus who states in the Sermon on the Mount that anyone who is angry at his brother for an unjust cause is liable to for judgment. That's the anger that he's speaking of. It's the anger where I'm angry because you have hurt me. Not angry that you're hurting yourself or you're hurting somebody else. If we are ang when we're angered, when we're angered, I should say, we say things that we don't want to say. We take actions that whenever our rational, sane mind takes control of our body again, we go, why would I ever do that? That's why James says in James chapter 1 that the anger of man, that, that self-indignation, that anger, doesn't produce the righteousness that God requires. There's a, a whole myriad of ways that we use our anger in improper ways, and we are told to learn how to control that. And there's all kinds of techniques, and we don't have the time this morning to go through all those techniques and how to control our anger. But even the righteous indignation that we had spoke of, we are to control ourselves in that as well. One of the, my favorite stories when it comes to this topic is when Jesus drives out the money changers in the temple. He does it two times in the very first year of his ministry and the very last year of his ministry. But when John talks about it in the Gospel of John, he makes the point that Jesus took the time to make a whip before he drove out the animals. Now, the whip was not for the people. The whip was for the animals to drive them out. Let's make that clear. But the point was is that here Jesus sees it. He is angered at it. He has, that, he has that righteous indignation, and yet he takes the time to make the whip, to, control, to consider his actions, to control himself, to make sure that what he does from there on out is measured. <coughs> so even in our, our righteous indignation, we need to be self-controlled in those things. Look over with me to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. The next thing we want to look at is the, the reaction of jealousy or envy. Those two words are kind of synonymous for jealousy and, and envy. Uh, jealousy is really the discontent or the unhappiness that one feels when someone else gets what you want. Here in James chapter 3, there in verse 16, James makes the point, For where jealousy and <coughs> selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. That all of those things that come about come about through the ideas of jealousy and <coughs> selfish ambition. Um, Paul puts it this way in Galatians chapter 5. Over in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 and in verse 20. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 and verse 20. Paul says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dis dissensions, and divisions. 
Now, this is the passage we know that he compares and contrasts the works of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit. And on the negative side, on that negative list, is jealousy. And so when Paul, when he writes a couple books later over to the Colossians, in Colossians chapter 3, he tells us to put a death <coughs> sentence on those parts of our, our emotions and our reactions for the things that happen. He says this in verse 5. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, he says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual morality and impurity, passions, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Those are the thing. Covetousness is the idea of I want something that you have. And sometimes what you want and other people have is, is simply recognition or praise. Sometimes it's an object or sometimes it's an experience. Envy and jealousy are akin in their definitions. It's really just wanting what someone else has and you don't have. Sometimes it derives from the idea that I deserve what you have. I've worked hard. You've worked hard. We both deserve the same thing. Or I have been particularly good. Now, shouldn't God bless me with the things that he has blessed you with? Because I've been just as righteous as you have. Or sometimes it even works in the reverse. If I ha that you have something that you don't deserve, and I deserve it. I've worked harder than you have, and you have more than I have. Or you have the particular thing or the praise or whatever it is that you, the other person has. Sometimes it's, I've been better than you have. Why would God bless you if I've been better than you? And in either way, jealousy is rooted in the feeling that, that what we have is not good enough. And what someone else has is really what we should deserve. We feel that because we've worked hard or because we have tried enough or that we have been good enough, we perhaps believe that we deserve something more than we have. But we must not suppose that we deserve more. It's God in his infinite wisdom who chooses the blessings that we need and deserve in our lives. By being ungrateful for not receiving the things that we wish we have, in essence, we're telling God that he is not wise enough or not good enough to give us the things that he should have given us in the first place. God has given us the blessings that we need for particular purposes in our lives. Sometimes he has given and, when, and he has taken away, as we talked about a few weeks ago, to teach us lessons or to reward us with the things that we have or to give us so that we can share with somebody else. God has given us far more abundantly than the things, and all things, that we even deserve. More than that, he has given us more than we can really even understand. I remember as a, as a teenager growing up, I was told that you just do not know the love that your parents have until you have kids. And I think that's absolutely true. It's really hard to know what the love of a parent is until you get to be a parent. It's one of those difficult things. There are so many things that we cannot comprehend the love that God has shown us already. The blessings that are going to be that we have no idea what they're going to be until we get to experience them. Who are we to tell God that he has not blessed us enough? Paul puts it this way when he writes to Timothy, with food and clothing, we shall be content. As long as we have food and clothing, anything else we can lose, gain, give away, but with food and clothing, we shall be content. And yet, so many times when we look at other people, we say, well, God hasn't given me enough. He hasn't been wise enough to give me what I deserve. He hasn't been faithful enough to provide me all that I want. I guess we should be ashamed of ourselves when we think that way. When we're jealous of others and we are being self-absorbed, we forget really about the other person. We are told to rejoice with those who rejoice. And that cannot happen if I'm jealous with you. I can't both be rejoicing with you while secretly wanting all the things that you have. We should be excited for them. We should rejoice that God has chosen to bless them with those things. Even if we wanted that very thing, we should, be, we should allow their joy to become our joy in some degree. We shouldn't begrudge them of their happiness. We should join in on their happiness. Uh, from, the, from a little child, we had a, um, I think it was Buddy Payne that came up to Pittsburgh, for those who know who Buddy Payne is. And he gave, a, he gave an excellent series of lessons on the history and geography of Egypt and all the archaeological information that kind of ties along with that. And I think I was about Levi's age or Lydia's age, and I begged to be the person who remembered those old sliding, rotating slides that would fall down. And we had a broken one, so someone had to stand up there manually and change that. And so I begged him to be the little kid who did that. And from 
from that age, I've always wanted to go to Egypt. And for those who know Lee, Lee got to go to Egypt about three weeks ago in his work. And not only did he get to go to Egypt and see the pyramids and the Sphinx and go to the, the Egyptian um, museum, he got to go inside the Great Pyramid. Like, nobody gets to go inside the Great Pyramid. I could be jealous. But the thing was, I got to talk to Lee, he got to show me pictures, he got to give me first-hand experience of what it was like to be there, gave me an idea of what the scale is and the scope is, and the time frame that all those things happened. And instead of being jealous, I got to share in with all of his experiences. <coughs> I get to join in with his joy, and I get to share with his experience, with his knowledge now. And that's, a, that's a great thing that he got to do that. And it's great that I get to be his friend, and I get to share in those things. And there's all kinds of blessings in life that it works the same way. If I'm if I'm angry at you for the good things that you're rejoicing in, I don't get to share in any of those blessings. But if I rejoice with those who rejoice, I get to share in all those things. Turn to be the first Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three. In our society, we are taught to stand up for yourself and defend yourself. Fight for what is yours. Take what you can get and give nothing back. Christianity isn't about fitting into our society. It's really standing apart from our society. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that we are to go out from among their midst and be separate. And going out from among their midst and be separate isn't a physical separation. It's a spiritual one. It's a moral one. That our morality is different from the world around us. So look at a few passages here um, that talk about what we should be doing when it comes to defending or fighting for what is, is ours. Here in 1 Peter chapter 3, there in verse 9, he tells us, Do not repay evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. A Paul writes, when he writes to the Romans in Romans chapter 12, and he phrases it in this way. <coughs> there in Romans chapter 12, look with me in verses 19 down to verse 21. Romans chapter 12, verses 19, down to verse 20, 21. It says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by good. And again, here's one of those times I should have rearranged the passages a bit better. First Peter, again, chapter 2. First Peter, chapter 2, there in verse 23, Peter writes, For when he, which is Jesus, was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued to entrust himself to him who judges justly. Remember the, the childhood thing of why did you hit your sister? That's what I heard all the time. Because she hit me first. Or because she looked at me. Or whatever it was. And that was the reaction, the retaliation of that childhood mentality of she did this, so I'm going to do it in return. And oftentimes we as adults haven't grown up from that mentality. Well, why did you do that? Well, because they did this first. And what we have is a resounding, unassailable shout from the scriptures that retaliation and revenge can never be our reaction. Paul writes to the Romans, never revenge yourself. Here, Peter writes, here of Jesus in chapter 2, that whenever he uh, was reviled, he was never reviled in return when he suffered. That means when he was rejected, when he was beaten, when he was mocked, when he was uh, stripped, put on a cross, and killed, never once did a threat cross his lips. Not even a threat, not a retaliation, and certainly not a threat. But he continued to trust himself to God. Peter writes over in chapter 3 that we are not to repay evil for evil, but on the contrary, to bless. And then Paul writes in Romans that we're not just to not um, repay evil for evil, or not to revenge ourselves, but he says to go in the opposite direction, to be a blessing. If your enemy needs something to eat, if you need something to drink, you give them something to drink. We are called to be a blessing, not just to not retaliate, not to revenge, which shouldn't be our reaction, but to go the extra direction and to bless. And that can't happen if we are constantly...
constantly thinking of how to revenge ourselves or retaliate or to fight for what's ours. And one of the, the neatest things you go over Isaiah chapter 53, it talks about the, the, the prophecies of Jesus. And one is that he will do no violence. And I wonder about that in our lives, that we are we retaliate and revenge. If we do violence, how can we call ourselves followers of Jesus? If that wasn't his character, and he calls us to be like him, to walk as he walked, to conduct himself as he conducted himself, can we call ourselves children of God if retaliation, revenge, and violence are a part of our reactions? Oftentimes we don't plan to go out and plan to revenge. Well, sometimes we do. That's another story I'll forget. But we're talking about reactions. When we react, do we react in a, in a mentality of, I want to get that person back, or do I wish them ill will for the things that happen? And that happens in, in the smallest of things, and someone cuts you off in traffic, oh, I hope there's a cop up there waiting for you. So the bigger things in life, I hope that, you know, to the point sometimes people wish that other people would die for the things that they've done. Anything in between those two things are not called for us as Christians. We are to leave those things to the wrath of God. Our job as here on earth is to bless, to go out of our way to continue to sacrifice. If we are sued for our cloak, for our, our tunic, we should give them our cloak also. If we're compelled to go one mile, we go two miles. That is the resounding command for us as Christians. Turn with me to Luke. We'll try to keep these ones in order in Luke. Uh, Luke chapter 12. Another reaction that often happens is fear and doubt. Jesus talking to his disciples here in Luke chapter 12 at the beginning of the chapter there in verse 4. He says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and then after that have nothing more that they can do. But down in verse 6 and verse 7 he says, but are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And are not one of them, and not one of them is forgotten before God? Why, even the hairs of your head are numbered. So fear, fear not, you are more valuable than many sparrows. And there in Philippians chapter 4, Paul writes to the Philippians, when Paul is probably one of his, his most dire situations, he tells them there in verse 6, Philippians chapter 4 there in verse 6, he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplications, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. There's a lot of bad things that happen in life. And there's a lot of things that you never count on to happen, that happen. A lot of situations that you never expected. And fear can be a natural reaction to the things that happen. We fear for either what is currently happening to us or what might come down the track later in life. Well, if this happens now, then we're going to deal with this or that in the future. And we just have anxiety over those things. And fear is rooted in dis distrust. We never really talk about fear and distrust going in the same sentence. But those really are the ideas. I don't know what is going to happen in the future, but I have a feeling that it's not going to be good. I'm not sure what's going to come out of these situations, but I don't think it's going to work out to the best. But we have passages like Romans chapter 8, that all things work together for good, for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Here's a passage that Jesus states in Luke chapter 12, don't fear. Paul tells us to not be anxious. And yet, so oftentimes, we consume ourselves with what might be, because we don't know what God's going to do. And sometimes we doubt that he's going to do what's best for us. Fear is a natural reaction, but how we manage that fear is really the key. Do we allow fear to drive us into inaction, or drive us into the wrong actions? Or do we manage our fear and rely on God? Those reactions are the key to our maturity. Things that happen to you when you're little, you get a different perspective as you grow up. When I was actually almost exactly Levi's age, our, our home burned down. Went to school, dad went to work, and came home, and like everything was normal until it wasn't normal. And within, I think it was like, I think mom said it was like 12 minutes, first fire to like the whole thing being just <coughs> in case and fire, it was 12 minutes. 12 minutes changed everything, right? And as, as an adult, I realized that my parents would have been our age. And probably would have been what's in, like, what are we going to do? But as a kid, all I really saw from them was an unassailable faith that things are going to work out. And through it all, we spent 
zero days homeless. We missed exactly zero meals. And things worked out just fine. Imagine like losing everything and my parents just keep on telling us as kids that things are gonna work out. And only to learn that things worked out. Fear is one of those things that is, a, is probably the best memory eraser that I know of. We look at things that look unsurmountable in the future, and we say, I have no idea how that's going to happen. And our memory is completely wiped that God has already taken care of many other things in our past that we never knew that he could take care of. It's that wonderful trick of, I don't know how it's going to work out, never worked out in the past, but yet God has always worked things out in the past. We cannot let fear and doubt of God be our reaction. The last couple passages, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. As Peter is kind of winding down his letter, he tells them there in 1 Peter chapter 4, there in verse 8, but above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Now, the, past, the context here is not keep loving one another um, occasionally, and it's not keep loving one another whenever things are good or whenever they're kind. It's in the context of people who are doing wrong to one another. Keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, there in verse 14, Paul says, The whole law is fulfilled in one word, that you shall love your neighbors as yourself. And then Romans chapter 13, and verse 8, of just a phenomenal way of, of viewing it. Owe one another nothing except to love one another. For the love, the one who loves one another fulfills the law. You know, our reaction should not be jealousy or strife. It shouldn't be a desire to have what they have or fear or doubt in the future. Our reaction should be that we are loving. That should be our natural reaction. And that's a hard thing to do, but that shows spiritual maturity when we allow that to be our knee-jerk reaction. We are called to love. We are be people who are known by our love for one another. Not only when things are good and people are being kind, but loving when things aren't good and people aren't kind. To love our neighbors, to pray for those who persecute us, to wish good and to do good for all around us. And selflessness is the way that we do that can't think of ourselves as being more worthwhile or more worthy or better than other people. We don't become preoccupied with what we want. We are occupied with the things that are best for others, their interest, and we esteem them as just being just as worthy as we are. We can't have Christ-like actions without Christ-like attitudes towards others. And that goes for those inside of our family and inside of our friends and those outside of our family and friends. As you look at the parable of the Good Samaritan, probably one of the most well-known ones, and the idea of the lawyer that he had as we look at over in the Luke, is he tried to, to justify himself. Well, who is my neighbor? And he expected Jesus to say, well, it's, it's those who are around you right now. The lawyer was, was surrounded by his friends as he comes to Jesus there in Luke. And he expects them to say, well, it's those people. It's your friends. It's your, your close neighbors. Your close friends. And the answer that he gets is that your neighbor is really anybody that you come in contact who has need. That should be our natural reaction to the things that, that come upon us. And so for my challenge this week, is I want you to take some time this week and not only ask yourselves, what am I planning to do this week? Or planning to do Monday or planning to do Tuesday? But what is my reaction when things don't go the way that they're expected? Do I outburst in anger? Do I have problems with jealousy? Do I have problems with trust or doubt when things go wrong? Do I rely on God? Do I have a natural reaction to try to be kind and gentle and understanding to people who are currently irritating us or wishing us harm? How are we reacting to situations in life? <coughs> there is a level of maturity that goes into planning to do good throughout the week, and there's a whole other level of maturity that plans to react well. So that's my challenge this week, is to kind of maybe keep a mental list or keep a physical list of how your reactions are this week to kind of gauge where you are and start planning to react better. The song of invitation that Jeff has picked out is number 830. <coughs> One of the key reactions 
is how you react when you find out that you really have a need for God. We see this time and again of individuals who they think that they're doing perfectly fine until the time that they recognize that they truly and wholeheartedly need God in their lives. And in Acts chapter 2, we have a whole group of people who have come to Pentecost. Thousands of people have come to Pentecost and hear the fact that they have missed the Messiah. And some of them had the reaction of what should we do? And Peter gives the answer to repent from your past deeds, to plan for a better future in that repentance, and to be baptized at the point where you receive forgiveness of your sins and to live faithfully from then on out. If we can help you this morning to come to Jesus or come back to him, let us know as we stand and sing number 830. Why keep Jesus waiting, waiting in the
were told to do so in remembrance of them and also in a worthy manner. As I've said repeatedly, the words I say cannot prepare your mind for the observing of the Lord's Supper. Only He can do that. If you have a favorite passage that you prefer to turn to during this memorial, now would be the time to do that. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence at this time, giving thanks for your Son and the sacrifice he made for us so we have that hope of eternal life. Father, as we partake of this bread, we pray that we do so in remembrance of him, and we do so in a worthy manner, pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. So this is our prayer in his name.
suffer except in an apartment and we have that opportunity to give back a portion of that which we've been so blessed about. Will you bow with me please? Father in heaven we give thanks for this day and the blessings of life that you give us that are so abundant. <coughs> Heavenly Father as we give back a portion of that that you bless us with it's our prayer that we do so with a cheerful heart and that we use wisely in thy service. This is our prayer in your son's name. Amen. song is seven six seven seven six seven we'll sing all verses i'm not ashamed to oh my lord nor to defend his cause maintain the
Father, we ask you to be with each and every one of us all here today to worship you in spirit and truth. Father, the things that were said and done in this service today will be in according with your will. Father, we ask you now that you go with each one of us. Lead, guide, and direct us. Forgive us of our wrongs when we repent of them. For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Thank you. 